Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for uh, coming to the Transplant Institute lecture series. And uh, my name is Marwan Abuzud, and uh, we're very lucky today to have with us Dr. David Klassen uh, from uh, UNOS, the United Network of Organ Sharing. Um, the programs that we've had so far um, were diverse in the sense that the topics related to our uh, practice day to day or innovations in clinical practice. And this is along the lines of our continuous pursuit of process improvement and patient safety. And Dr. Klassen was uh, uh, appointed as the Chief Medical Officer at UNOS in 2014 uh, as part of the strategic effort for UNOS to develop uh, clinical protocols and work with the medical community and also improve on patient safety around the country. Dr. Klassen is a transplant nephrologist by training. He trained, actually he's from Ohio, uh, and he got his medical education at Ohio State University, and that's all right, because we're not maize and blue here. That's right. So we are impartial. And he went on to Johns Hopkins, where he did his nephrology training and transplant training as well, and went on to the University of Maryland, which is quite interesting. It's almost like coming to Fort from U of M. And he did his clinical practice there for his entire career, where he was the director of kidney pancreas transplantation, and he was part of that massive growth that uh, Maryland has gone through, which was very unique. And subsequently, he came on to UNOS, and I think UNOS is very lucky to have him. He's done, uh, he's very well published in areas of uh, clinical transplantation and acute rejection, chronic rejection. And one of the more interesting papers that I read for him was um, the donor potential study in the United States. That's something that will hopefully poke his uh, intellect a little bit later after the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Klassen. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Marwan. I appreciate the, the invitation to uh, speak here at Henry Ford. I uh, feel very honored to do so, uh, particularly on the topics uh, related to quality and patient safety because um, Henry Ford certainly is, is known as a leader in that, in, in that area and has been for many years. And so, you know, within UNOS itself as, a, as, a, as an organization, we're actually also working on, on our own internal quality, uh, quality programs. And, you know, I sort of think perhaps we should come here and learn from you uh, as well. But um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, patient safety, uh, not so much quality per se, but patient safety, although clearly there is a lot of overlap. Um, and I want to describe, this is my top, the title is a bit of a mouthful, but really what I want to do, talk to you about is sort of how UNOS handles patient safety reporting, what we do with the data, how we analyze it, kind of the things we see, and sort of what, what sort of some of the initiatives going forward um, are. And so, um, I have, and I have some fairly recent data as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, kind of work through this. And so again, uh, what I want to do is, uh, uh, look over the current uh, process of patient safety reporting to UNOS. We have a very uh, well-defined structure, at least I think so, to do that and review some recent data, um, uh, classifications and trends, which way things are going, and then again discuss uh, some of the future directions. Um, kind of just to set the stage um, here, uh, you know, I, we, we like to, to show these slides from UNOS uh, looking at strategic plans and goals and, uh, and clearly this has been directed by the community. Uh, and one is to increase the number of transplants, that's our primary goal, but also uh, promote living donor and transplant safety and that's, I think that's where this talk is, is focused upon. Um, sort of a new thing for UNOS is really to try to uh, like many organizations, match our, our resources to our, to our goals. Um, and UNOS is, is not uh, enormously deeply resourced, although we have adequate resources, but, but again, trying to match uh, goals uh, with resources and primarily looking at increasing transplants. Um, and, and really, at the moment, our, you know, promoting safety, we list it as 10%, but that does not uh, mean that patient safety is any less important. Uh, you know, we're still fully committed to doing that. Um, and in fact, historically, that's uh, been a, a huge part of what UNOS has been all about. Um, you know, UNOS's core functions, as I see them, really are three. We do the match, we do the allocation, we do the data, 
uh, and we do quality improvement. And we do quality improvement oversight for transplant programs and OPOs across the country as well, for, as, well as for ourselves. Um, and the goal really is to, to do more transplants um, in a fair, effective, safe, and, and efficient uh, manner. Um, we do this really uh, with the legal mandate from uh, HRSA. HRSA is the Health, Re Health Resources and Services Administration, and, and that's the governmental uh, organization part of HHS that gives us the contract to run the OPO. And what this says is that the OPO contractor is critical to the Department of HHS's ability to exercise um, appropriate oversight over the OPTN um, and really to promote uh, public safety and the health of uh, patients, including recipients, candidates on the list, uh, organ, living organ donors. Um, and so that really is sort of, we do have a legal mandate to, to do the sort of things that we do. Um, and HRSA, about um, seven or eight years ago, really put a big focus on doing this and, and really directed the OPO to uh, beef up uh, efforts uh, in terms of quality oversight um, and patient safety. And the final rule, which was promulgated in uh, 1999, uh, really uh, kind of gives legal uh, backing to do this. And so we do have, um, so we, you know, we answer to transplant programs. UNOS is a membership organization, but we also a uh, answer to the government as well. So we have sort of our, our feet in, on both sides of that, of that divide. Um, and we want to try to get everybody working together. Um, so when we tried, you know, starting in about 2011, UNOS you know, put a major effort to try to, to uh, beef up uh, the patient safety reporting. Um, and, and we kind of really looked at, at what were the goals for this. And we decided that the goals were really fourfold, to, to identify current and ongoing patient safety or, uh, issues and potential threats to the public health. Um, and to ensure that interventions uh, that we implemented, implemented were uh, designed to eliminate risk and potential harm. And also to collect data, because again, one of our core functions is collecting data, uh, to analyze trends and recognize patterns and, and uh, identify gaps. And then uh, to use all this data to identify uh, opportunities for educational improvement uh, and policy development. So what uh, the first kind of question we asked ourselves was what, what kind of things should be reported? What are we interested in looking at? And we came up with a number of them. You know, compliance with OPTN policy, that's uh, one thing that uh, is a component of this. Uh, documenting medical errors, uh, communication breakdowns, uh, poor outcomes that were a result of, act, of action uh, or failure to act, uh, data entry errors, um, were, were considered Trans, uh, transportation errors. We'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, we, a lot of organs move across the country every day. I'm sure there are some coming through the uh, Detroit Metro Airport at this moment. Uh, systems failures and then identify quality improvement opportunities. Um, when we got down to the nitty gritty about this, what we really thought we should be, we, what, what we thought we should be doing uh, w was really identifying potential violations of policy um, and incidents involving patient safety, uh, things that we identified as threats to the integrity of the OPTN itself, uh, and I'll, give you, I'll go in, uh, into some of these in, in more detail, uh, confirmed or suspected communicable disease transmissions, and that includes uh, not only infectious diseases but also malignancies, um, and then living donor um, adverse events as well. And so I'm going to kind of go through each of these um, um, separately here for a minute. So potential violations of, of OPTN policy um, or impacts to patient safety. And this really uh, compromises, um, and we try to define this fairly broadly, any event uh, that is a, uh, a threat to patient safety in public health, and particularly events that involve harm uh, which was preventable. Um, harm that was caused by uh, uh, violation of policies um, uh, and incidents where the, uh, the potential to cause harm in, 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 instead of actual harm uh, existed. Uh, some examples of this uh, that, that you can relate to potentially for trans and this involved transplant hospitals, um, OPOs and uh, laboratories as well. Uh, we have some degree of oversight over HLA laboratories. An example would be storage of uh, hepatitis C positive vessels. 
Um, that certainly is something, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, actual versus intended uh, transplants. Um, you know, uh, one of the um, uh, CMS, you know, never events are, uh, is transplanting the wrong person or the wrong organ. Uh, vessels used in non-transplant patients uh, is an important thing. Uh, and patients listed with incorrect ABOs, uh, for example. Again, these are, there are many, many such things, but these are just some, some, uh, some examples. Uh, OPOs, organs not labeled properly, uh, laterality errors. Um, it's surprisingly common, or relatively speaking, um, you know, confusing the left kidney from the right kidney, which has clinical implications. Uh, improper packaging, labeling, hemo hemodilution miscalculations. Uh, lots of HLA discrepancies come to light uh, from laboratory, reporting uh, errors there, testing errors, and specimen uh, mix-ups. Um, threats to trust or integrity of the, of the OPTN also, I think, are important. The whole system really relies on public trust, and so uh, if public trust in the OPTN is lost, I think then the whole system will suffer for that. Um, and examples might be unfair or inequitable organ allocation um, or transplant practices. Uh, this can result uh, from center practices um, uh, as well as uh, just uh, human errors. Uh, preventable discard of viable organs due to error or oversight. Um, gross negligence or general misconduct, unsafe practices. Well, I'll go over some examples of some of these. Uh, media items regarding transplant practice. Um, you know, we publicly practice medicine in a very public world these days. Um, and so a, a lot of um, things come to light in the media uh, that really need to be addressed uh, to make sure that that what happens is reported accurately and, and fairly. Um, and we occasionally receive accusations of unethical practices, tampering with medical records, things like uh, this. Um, valuable considerations, it is of course illegal to uh, sell organs in the United States. Um, and so these are some of the, um, some of the things uh, that we're, we're interested in. Uh, living donor adverse events. Uh, these are required to be reported to HRSA. Uh, death of a living donor, uh, failure of native organ uh, or living donor um, uh, function uh, in terms of, you know, a, a kidney uh, donor who uh, ends up being a dialysis patient, for instance, uh, or gets listed for a transplant, we're required to report that. Uh, living donor organs that are transplanted, that are recovered but not transplanted, uh, or, or organs uh, that are recovered but transplanted into a different recipient or aborted uh, procedures. Um, all of these are required to be reported um, to, to the OPTN. Uh, confirmed or suspected donor-derived disease transmission. And again, as I mentioned, this includes uh, infection, malignancies. Um, and this, this is actually very, very time sensitive. Um, a donor-derived infection that perhaps you recognize here at Henry Ford actually has implications uh, all across the country, those donor organs. Uh, uh, from that donor may have been transplanted, you know, on the West Coast, the East Coast, uh, or, or in multiple transplant centers. Um, and reporting of these is both an OPO and transplant center um, responsibility. So I'm going to go through some of these um, a bit further. Um, so, uh, you know, about in 2011, we developed the uh, UNOS um, Improving Safety um, Patient Portal uh, for electronic reporting of of uh, safety events. And this is a, a screenshot here from, uh, from the OPTN website. Um, and you can see uh, uh, it's a prominently displayed thing. Uh, and I'll go through some of the data as well. I'm going to focus primarily on uh, the safety situation reporting, which is this button down here. But there are separate pathways for disease, disease transmission um, and uh, living donor um, adverse event reporting um, as well. And, and so I'll go through these. Um, as well. Uh, we get data not only from the safety portal, but from other sites. Uh, and so there is an internal uh, safety, patient safety um, analysis group that looks at these events. Uh, we actually have six full-time staff members that do nothing but handle uh, patient safety uh, event reporting. Uh, and we get a lot of data from other places. Uh, site surveyors, uh, when you get your site survey, we sometimes uh, find things that are, are of interest. Um, every single allocation uh, that UNOS does is reviewed 
uh, by our, there's an allocation staff that looks at every single one uh, to make sure that the allocation uh, followed uh, policy. Uh, re the regional administrators uh, are sometimes contacted about safety concerns. Um, on my desk uh, in Richmond, I occasionally get letters, anonymous letters from uh, people who have concerns or programs that have concerns about something that may have occurred. Uh, reports get submitted to HRSA. Uh, we get referrals from the Disease um, Transmission Advisory Committee, um, and occasionally uh, patient uh, uh, issues arise directly from patients. Um, some of this we also get um, uh, data from our, our research department. Um, an example of this would be uh, the vessel collect or vessel storage issues. Um, it's not permissible to store HCV positive vessels in a transplant center. Uh, however, we um, know all donors that are HIV, HCV positive, and uh, you're also required to report um, all, all vessel storage. And so the, every day the uh, UNOS research department generates a report uh, which kind of merges those two data fields. And so uh, programs that store HCV, HCV positive vessels, we uh, find out about that automatically. Um, and those are reviewed um, as well. I'm going to go through a couple of cases here just to kind of illustrate what, these, what some of these uh, cases might be like. Uh, and these are actually things that are, uh, you know, I've changed the names to protect the innocent. Uh, but in fact, these are real events. Um, and they're kind of going from simple uh, to more complicated. Um, so the first case here at, at the airport, uh, the donor kidney is being shipped and a pushback tractor runs over the organ container. Okay, that, you know, is a real event. Uh, and, that, and that's sort of an example of stuff that happens. Um, so, you know, is there a policy violation there? No, not really. Uh, you know, UNOS doesn't have any policy, any regulatory oversight over airline function. Um, and uh, so it is just one of those events that happens and gets reported. And this would be sort of, uh, we do monitor transportation uh, errors. Um, interestingly, um, a lot of people don't realize that organs do travel on commercial airlines by and large, kidney and pancreas transplants at least in particular. Um, and they're not, they don't sit in the first class, uh, they go in the baggage compartment, uh, you know, where, where your pets go. Uh, it's, it's heated and, and, um, and, there, and there is sort of a human handoff that occurs, but in fact, uh, it really um, uh, is, is not uh, quite like you might imagine. Uh, UNOS has actually explored other couriers uh, from commercial airlines, you know, like, like UPS or FedEx, uh, and actually they want nothing to do with it. Um, I think they, they view that uh, shipping organs to recipients as a potential liability. Um, and so uh, even though we've explored other alternatives, um, so far commercial airlines um, is the way to go, uh, which, which comes with a lot of um, potential problems, and I can give you some more specifics later. Uh, case two, uh, here a transplant surgeon is doing a hepatitis C positive donor liver transplant, and he tells the circulating nurse, save the extra vessels, um, anticipating that there may be a difficult anastomosis. Um, well, in fact, the vessels were not used, um, and the nurse goes ahead and stores the vessels in the vessel storage refrigerator, and that's a clear violation. You are not permitted as a safety um, uh, event uh, as a potential safety event to store hepatitis C positive donor um, vessels. And so this might be something that we would be uh, aware of just based on, uh, from analyzing our data uh, and we would contact the center to find out you know, what, what's, come up, what's come up here. Uh, here's a third case. Uh, and th again, these are real cases uh, that, that actually happened. Uh, because a deceased donor previously resided in Guatemala, uh, serologic testing for Chagas disease is sent to an outside lab at the time of procurement. Uh, the OPO, this is clearly a send out, and so the procurement went ahead, went ahead and happened. Uh, the coordinator from the OPO goes on vacation and neglects to tell the OPO staff about the pending test. Uh, in this case, the OPO had no standard uh, procedure for tracking pending lab results, um, and when the test returns in a week, uh, the, the um, uh, coordinator being on vacation, um, it, it's not, the, the, the uh, test gets overlooked. About six weeks later, uh, the patient who received the heart is admitted with fever and a rash, uh, and ultimately a diagnosis of Chagas disease was made, 
the transplant center notifies the OPO uh, and the OPO re and, and reports it to the UNO safety uh, portal. Uh, the OPO then notifies uh, the programs that transplanted the other organs involved from this donor. Uh, but unfortunately, the heart recipient dies um, as a result of Chagas disease. Uh, the other uh, patients are treated um, and do well. Um, and so again, this is an example of a safety event reporting where really I think the OPO you know, needed to revisit its structures in terms of data, how it manages data. And then a fourth um, uh, example case. Um, here a man, a uh, relatively young man, is taken to a local hospital following a motor vehicle accident. Uh, he's, he's given IV fluids and transfused with eight units of red cells. Um, in the night, he's uh, relatively quickly transferred to a tertiary hospital, um, given more IV fluids en route. Um, the next day, he's taken to the OR for an exploratory um, laparotomy, and he's given gets six more units of blood, four units of FFP. Uh, in the next 24 hours, he returns for urgent re-exploration, receives more units of blood, uh, but ultimately, unfortunately, um, becomes brain dead. Uh, his family gives consent for organ donation, but wants it to happen rel relatively quickly. Uh, the OPO coordinator does not have access to the records uh, from the initial hospitalization um, and, uh, um, that w occurred prior to being transferred to the tertiary care center, and five organs are transplanted. Uh, the it's interesting, actually, the tissue bank, uh, where tissue went, subsequently notifies the OPO that in its review of the records, uh, it believes that the samples used for serologic testing were hemodiluted, um, and the um, tissue bank then discards all the tissue. Uh, the OPO is notified, reviews the case, and discovers that it neglected um, to calculate uh, the role of the transfusions um, in, in the initial um, evaluation of the donor. Um, and so, in fact, it turns out that the serologic testing uh, was not valid uh, for that donor. So a report is made to the UNO safety por uh, portal, and then all programs that transplanted organs uh, were made aware of the fact that the um, uh, serologic testing uh, potentially was not valid for those uh, for those transplants. So these would be our kind of typical cases um, that get reported. Um, and we see these um, uh, uh, virtually every day, actually, in some fashion. Um, I kind of want to walk through some of these pathways, uh, again, in this case, for di uh, disease transmission. Um, so what happens uh, internally at UNOS when a p uh, potential disease transmission case is reported? Um, the center or OPO reports it, uh, and a safety analyst, uh, there is a staff of two people at UNOS that, that receive nothing but disease transmission reports. Uh, the case gets reviewed internally to determine the likelihood that the donor, that this is a donor-derived infection. Uh, we often get multiple reports on the same event. Um, the um, safety analyst may request additional information. Um, depending on the, um, the uh, um, potential organism involved, uh, CDC may in, be involved, um, and we ensure that other centers are notified as appropriate. Uh, the Disease Transmission Advisory Committee leadership is notified, and they review uh, all the cases uh, as they occur. Um, and we use this data to develop some guidance documentations and recommendations um, as well. Uh, this is actually data um, of, of potential donor-derived disease transmission events. That's what Pete, the acronym stands for there. Uh, and these are reviewed by the Disease Transmission Advisory Committee. And this shows um, data over the years from, from um, 2008 up until 2015. Uh, and the green bars are the total number of events reported. Uh, and the um, blue bars are the actual ones that were reviewed. That were reviewed. And so you can see uh, in 2015, and we got about you know, 400, 400 or so, uh, 450 reports, and reviewed about 300. And I think that's actually up uh, these days uh, as well. And, and um, I think as, as recognition continues and the requirements for reporting are more broadly um, appreciated, uh, this has continued to rise. And it's quite a bit higher than that this year. So in fact, we receive these reports uh, virtually every day. Um, and they are reviewed by the Disease Transmission Advisory Committee. Uh, and they are classified and analyzed in a fairly, um, fairly rigorous fashion. Um, and then they are categorized. And so uh, the DTAC classification system 
uh, a, uh, a proven disease transmission includes uh, the donor plus one other recipient. A probable disease transmission includes uh, one or more recipients with suggestive data. A possible transmission is included uh, suggestive evidence but not proven. Uh, a lot of cases get treated um, just based on the history, uh, and so this is considered intervention without documented transmission, and that's where uh, antibiotics are given. You know, a, a patient, a center is notified that the um, donor had a positive uh, blood culture for staph epi, for instance. Um, that notification goes out to all centers, um, and commonly patients are treated with, without uh, any real true documentation that disease transmission occurred, uh, but that um, um, uh, because of antibiotics, uh, it was potentially prevented. Um, and then unlikely uh, or excluded with no evidence um, of disease transmission. Again, so, um, you know, I get copied on most of these emails, and so certainly, um, you know, there are, are, they come through every single week um, and, and virtually every day. Um, just to kind of show you what happens, uh, this is the data uh, from 2014 in terms of potential donor-derived disease events in, in that year, and this is the most recent year that I could get complete data for. Um, there were um, 278 potential uh, disease transmissions reported um, to us, uh, and they were divided, uh, about 200 were infections, um, and about 70 were malignancies. And just to kind of give you a sense of the scope, um, about half of these, uh, of these 200 were excluded uh, after review uh, by the Disease Transmission Advisory Committee. Uh, 55 were treated, uh, but without documented transmission. Uh, there were 12 possible uh, transmissions and, and one, uh, or excuse me, 25 proven disease transmissions. Um, and if you think about that, if there are about, it kind of actually, it sounds like a lot, uh, but if you think as, as a percentage of the total number of transplants being done, it's actually relatively few. And so if you, if there are 25 proven events, if there are approximately 30,000 transplants done uh, across the country per year, we're talking about one-tenth of one percent uh, of all transplants involve uh, a potential proven uh, disease transmission from an infectious disease standpoint. Uh, for malignancies, uh, which are very important, um, uh, again, most of these are excluded, um, but there really have been a relatively small handful of proven uh, malignancy transmissions uh, through organ transplantation. Uh, just to kind of give you a, an idea of how these um, sort out, these are the, again, the 200 uh, 2014 infections, um, and you can kind of see how they, uh, it's a busy slide, but, you know, coag negative staph would be the largest, other bacteria, mostly bacterial infections, viral infections, including um, hepatitis, CMV, um, other viral uh, infections, and then a, a lot of um, uh, fungal infections as well. Uh, but in terms of actual, and these are the potential ones, but in terms of actually actual proven transmissions, uh, relatively rare, fortunately. Uh, for malignancies, uh, the thing that pops up most commonly, again, there, I don't know that there's a lot of um, uh, reason, rhyme or reason to this, but clearly uh, renal cell carcinomas are the most common one, and that's in large part because of the number of kidneys that are being transplanted, um, and so that, that is the most common uh, uh, case that gets dealt with. Uh, interestingly, peanut allergies, you can transmit a peanut allergy through um, uh, organ donation. Uh, gets reported about once a year, um, and that's neither, that's, it's gets evaluated by the Disease Transmission Advisory Committee as well. Um, it's not a malignancy, uh, and it's not an infection, um, and I don't actually understand the mechanism of this, but presumably um, it occurs through, through immunolog transfer of immunologic sensitization through immune cells, uh, but it does happen uh, once in a while, and, and it maybe happens more than five times a year, but I think there's probably a lack of awareness of it. Uh, but it's sort of an interesting, um, an interesting event uh, when it does occur. Uh, let's focus now on kind of the patient's uh, safety monitoring, not the disease transmission events. Uh, but what happens when a safety report is um, submitted? Um, the first thing that happens is 
uh, through the safety portal, uh, there is triage. And we have a standard uh, sort of triage pro process uh, to really to determine if there is an ongoing concern for patient safety. And that's, you know, there are six patient safety analysts who receive these events. And there's a standardized um, uh, uh, protocol to go through. And, you know, I actually like have, have the worksheet here that the safety analysts use. Um, and it gets documented very nicely. And the goal is really to identify these because this is such time sensitive uh, material. Uh, and classified in terms of uh, high, high priority, medium priority, or low priority. Um, and, and we are required, um, or the safety analysts are required to notify uh, leadership at UNOS uh, based on uh, priority. So um, a medium priority requires uh, notifying uh, leadership within four hours of receipt uh, of it. High priority has to be notified um, on the spot. Uh, low priority is different, uh, one week uh, notification. Uh, there are things that must be um, notified immediately, um, and interestingly, you know, you're required to report things to UNOS, but we're required to report things to uh, HRSA. Um, so we have a, a, a list of uh, HRSA 24-hour notif notifiable events uh, that we are required to notify HRSA within uh, 24 hours of, and uh, those would be sort of obvious things such as, uh, and there's a list of them here, a transplant of the wrong organ into a wrong recipient. Uh, HRSA wants to know that. Uh, the death of a living donor, HRSA would like to know that as well. As, uh, clearly we all want to know that. I mean, we're all, we're all in this together. Um, but anything um, like that. And then there is a list of CMS never events. Uh, you know, operation uh, on, on the wrong donor, wrong side, wrong recipient, you know, those sorts of things. So there actually are 29 never events. And so those all are required to be reported to HRSA. Uh, quickly. Um, so the safety analysts then conduct uh, an initial investigation. We'll contact the center for more um, information. Uh, usually that's through uh, email, uh, sometimes phone. Um, and if it looks like there is something uh, potential of an ongoing nature, then uh, we tr attempt uh, to make sure that there is some containment plan um, uh, in place. Uh, then uh, these safety reports, there is a, we have a, at UNOS uh, a multidisciplinary committee uh, review group that we meet every week uh, and we, we, we review every single safety report that comes in uh, that is uh, put in for review. Um, and it's a multi um, a multidisciplinary group. It includes the uh, safety uh, analysts. It includes allocation, people from the allocation group. It includes um, um, leadership from the member quality department. Uh, it includes uh, the site survey people. Uh, so it's a big group and we go through every single case um, uh, kind of like a, you know, as a QA exercise and uh, I sit in on that um, meeting as well. Um, and then uh, a disposition is, and, and many of these um, uh, events can take weeks to resolve uh, ultimately, but so there's, we um, you know, kind of do intake of new cases and then review all the old cases uh, as, they, as, they, um, as they occur. Uh, and eventually we have a, a, a disposition, excuse me. Uh, we either close the event um, uh, or identify potential policy violations and sometimes these are referred on um, to the Membership and Professional Standards Committee. Uh, again, these are the HRSA 24-hour reportable events. Again, transplant of a wrong organ into a, a recipient or a near miss uh, is included in that. Um, any patient, it's, there's sort of a broad definition, any patient concern, safety concern that poses a serious or time-sensitive threat to public health uh, or safety, living donor deaths or, or living donor native organ failures, and again, the never events. Uh, we, what do we do with this data? Um, again, a lot of this data, uh, you know, we want to make good use of the data. We accumulate a lot of it. Um, it gets reported uh, to the OPTN Operations and Safety Committee. I think um, uh, you uh, currently have a representative from uh, uh, Henry Ford who is on that committee currently. Uh, I know Dr. Kim has been on it in the past. Um, uh, there is an enhanced classification system. We've tried to upgrade uh, sort of the reporting uh, of this data so that we can analyze it better. Uh, the research department makes use of it. 
Um, it's uh, identified, it's looked at through, a, through an aggregated uh, de-identified data set uh, by the committee. Um, and I, I'll show you um, some of the data here uh, in a minute. Um, there are a lot of complexities in, in analysis of this data. There is a lot of underreporting. Uh, clearly, many centers do not report safety events as adequately as should as they should. Uh, some patients are some centers are better at this than others. Um, the data shows that uh, of all the safety, there are about 250 transplant hospitals across the country, um, and of the data of the safety events that are reported. Uh, fully half of them come from 25 centers. So clearly, uh, there is a lot of underreporting out there. Um, and so this is sort of an educational opportunity um, because, you know, the safety events affect everybody. Um, and we're, again, looking to, um, to expand the uh, safety reporting so that it is done a bit more uniformly. Um, some cases are hard to classify. They can occur uh, and, and be classified into multiple, um, multiple classifications. And we attempt to, um, to, to really analyze the, the etiology of these events. Uh, we actually reported this, and this was a paper that, was, that came out of, uh, of this system about a year ago. It was, uh, it was uh, published last summer in the, um, uh, in the AJT. And this was actually the first paper on safety reporting that's ever been done from using the UNO safety reporting data. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of, a little bit of some of this data. Um, we really tried uh, in that paper to communicate um, uh, really what the etiology of these were and so uh, to try to define uh, what these issues were. So, um, hang in a minute. Uh, let's uh, I'm not sure why the Mac can't connect, but nonetheless, uh, communication issues, packaging issues, testing issues, transportation, uh, allocation issues, living donor issues. We tried to really tried to uh, classify these in terms of, of the etiology uh, of these. Should I, I'm sorry, I guess I can close, it, close that out. Later. There we go. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so here are some of the trends. You know, when the system really went live back in 2006, uh, you know, we didn't get many reports, um, but they continue to increase. Uh, and but underreporting still is a major issue. Uh, most of these reports, safety reports, come uh, through the safety portal. That's in the blue, um, and. Uh, uh, lesser number come through other sources. Again, this is from the research department, from you know, anonymous reports, from regional administration, uh, from a variety of sources. Uh, this is actually the data for the first half of this year. Uh, this, the, the, the Operations and Safety Committee hasn't seen this data yet, but I think they have a meeting coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and this is where the, where the um, uh, data is coming from currently this year. And so this is the uh, mode of receipt. So the patient safety, the online reporting uh, from the research department or from other sources. And you can see it kind of varies from month to month. Uh, but mostly, mostly comes from the data safety portal. Um, and this is the current data. Again, this is the first six months of this year. This is the case subject. like. Who are these reports about? Um, and what you can see is that um, about half of them are reports that are related to transplant center activities, um, and about half of them are, uh, are reports about OPO activities. And so that's not who reports it, but what the topic is. So uh, transplant centers will often report problems that they feel occur with the OPO. They'll say, you know, we, we received a kidney. Uh, that was labeled as the right kidney, but it really it was the left kidney. Uh, or there was uh, some anatomical description that was not correct, the organ label was not put in correctly, that sort of thing. Uh, OPOs can, sometimes will, will have issues with transplant centers, but it's about a 50-50 um, split. Um, uh, the light blue is sort of the HLA labs. Um, and so there are all, there's always a kind of low number of um, safety reports related to HLA lab function. 
Um, and we try to classify these in terms of the etiology. Um, this is uh, two years worth of data from 2012 to 2014. Um, again, the overwhelming cause uh, of these complaints tends to be communication breakdown. Uh, and that is what really is, is the major, um, the major etiology. And that can occur in both OPOs and transplant programs, obviously. The transplant process itself uh, occurs kind of testing issues, allocation or placement problems, packaging and shipping, uh, labeling, uh, data entry issues, recovery processes, uh, living donor events, um, and transportation um, issues um, occur as well. But primarily it's a communication issue. And sort of clearly these uh, communication issues, that's something that's very, very uh, amenable to change. There are going to be mistakes that happen. Um, you know, this, it's a human system. There are lots of moving pieces, lots of people involved. And communi but communication is something that I think everybody can work on uh, and de deriving, de devising uh, internal structures to address communications is important. Um, Let's see, and these are uh, reporting, this, again, this is the first six months of this year. It's kind of a busy slide, actually, uh, and, but it varies. In this case, in this year, communication issues seem to be down a little bit, um, and it looks like uh, the first six months, it's more transplant pr procedures and processing. Uh, a fair number of testing issues, um, not so much labeling issues at the moment, so, but again, the, the um, the uh, Operations and Safety Committee will get this data, review it, uh, and make potential recommendations. Uh, we take special uh, interest in, um, in data reports that impact organ use. Um, and, it, and this is, again, the first half of this year. So we've received, oops, um, we've received 117 reports. Um, 10 of these reports have been resulted in non-recovery of organs. Uh, nine have resulted in discards and 11 have resulted in delay or increased cold ischemia time. Um, and uh, so we have definitions for what constitutes increased cold ischemia time. Um, and so we look very, very carefully at these um, because these are, these are clearly uh, issues that result in uh, organ loss. Um, maybe I'll kind of go through these a little more quickly. Uh, things, uh, non-recovery, communication uh, issues, um, uh, transportation issues, packaging and shipping issues occur. Uh, cold ischemia time, transportation, packaging, shipping, uh, et cetera. Um, we, the, organ, the organ center uh, at UNOS tracks um, transportation failures, uh, organ center and near misses by months. And so you can see here, um, we track uh, transportation issues that result in organ loss. Uh, this is this month's data coming up right up uh, to last month, or, or to, um, I guess, August. Um, and the, uh, we have near misses. We track those as well. It's kind of interesting, uh, some of these things that happen here. Um, I think I have the report. Um, and this comes out quarterly. So if you look at these things, it's sort of interesting. In July, there were five transportation, transportation failures. Um, that resulted in discards. Two involved an OPO not having the organs ready at the agreed upon time. One instance of no ground courier being available for pickup. Uh, one flight cancellation. Uh, one instance of an, organ, of an airline failing to load the organ. Uh, there were 10 near misses. Um, let's see, we have five flight delays, one flight cancellation. Um, one instance of an airline staff not being available to load a package, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of just logistical stuff that tends to happen. Um, so what happens when we get these events here? Um, you know, uh, this is again uh, 2012 and to 2013. And that year there were 206 complaints. Uh, fully, so in terms of, you know, we want to get away from the kind of the punitive aspects of this whole system. But so really of these complaints, 103 were closed with no action. Uh, really clearly uh, we recognize that uh, events happen and some of them are not really amenable to correction necessarily. Um, so half of these were closed without any action. Uh, there were 99 
uh, notices of uncontested violation. Uh, these are things that went to the MPSC, um, Membership and Professional Standards Committee. And clearly, uh, you know, patient uh, centers make judgments, um, and sometimes policy is violated. But you know, that's not to say that uh, we don't expect that to happen. Uh, there were seven requests uh, from the MPSC for root cause analysis. There were five letters of warning, one letter of reprimand, and, and one institution was placed on probation. So, you know, really um, the notion of, an MP, of the MPSC as being primarily a punitive organization, I think we'd like to kind of um, get, get beyond that. Um, and, and really there was only one uh, institution placed on probation. Um, this is uh, looking again at reporting of uh, safety events. Um, this is um, what the, uh, research and the research department has done. There's something called a Gini coefficient, which I wasn't really um, uh, aware of. It's, it's actually used um, in economics to, um, to address issues of uh, income disparity and income concentration. And so if in, in economics, if income is distributed evenly over a population, you have a Gini of 0.5. Uh, if everybody you know, if all the income is, is concentrated in one individual, you have a genie of one. Um, and you can do the same thing for safety reporting. So if, if one institution reports all of the safety events, then the genie would be one. If everybody just does it equally, the genie would be 0.5. It's kind of like a C statistic, I guess. Um, anyway, so uh, if you look at transplant data reporting, safety reporting, uh, the genie is 0.76. Uh, and that's really, really awful actually. So what this really tells us is that uh, there are a lot of centers out there that are not reporting safety data and so we have a lot to do in terms of, of promoting safety um, reporting. Uh, again, this isn't uh, for the benefit of the entire system and so it's uh, clearly something that identifies educational opportunities for us at UNOS. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to do is devise safety reporting really to collect actionable data, excuse me, we want, you know, we want data that we can, that we can work with, that we can uh, do things with. Uh, technology innovation is part of this. Uh, we're looking at alternative monitoring proposals. Uh, these are sort of things that, are, that we want to do in educational efforts. Uh, and we're always looking for member input. I'm here to collect input from you as well. Uh, so if you have suggestions, we're not you know, trying to say that we have all the answers and, and you know, this is meant to be an evolutionary uh, enterprise. Um, the, the Disease Transmission Advisory Committee, um, they have a project currently uh, to improve post transplant communication of new donor information. Uh, this policy was approved by the board and is in the process of being implemented. Um, we're looking, uh, the Disease Transmission Advisory Committee is looking uh, to develop uh, guidance to uh, explain the risk um, uh, or how to explain risk uh, in organ allocation. The issue of PHS, high risk uh, or elevated increased risk uh, organs. How do you explain that to a patient? Uh, what does it really mean? Because uh, a lot of organs with, that are PHS high risk get discarded simply because of that. Uh, we're working on uh, educational guidance uh, for the use of kidneys with small renal cell carcinomas. Believe it or not, there are programs out there that will discard a kidney if the mate kidney had a small renal cell carcinoma in it. Um, and so we, we really want to uh, improve that. Uh, we've done a lot of patient safety education. There's uh, some videos uh, or webinars that have been done uh, trying to educate on hemodilution errors. Uh, there was one on ABO verification in the OR. Uh, one that's uh, on organ allocation deviations. Um, and so the MPSC also has some educational uh, efforts as well. Uh, in terms of uh, other things that, that have happened, um, the Transnet system uh, is an automated uh, system that's developed for uh, OPO use as well as transplant center uh, that really automates uh, organ labeling um, and documentation. Uh, you know, prior to the use of transmit, which is now mandated for, for um, OPOs, organ labels were filled out by hand. Uh, there's a lot of potential error for that. Uh, but what this really is, is sort of a, uh, it's basically based on barcodes. Um, and so uh, organs are tracked, the labels are printed automatically, um, and they can be tracked through the system. 
Uh, it's not currently mandated for use by um, transplant centers, um, but it is, uh, we're attempting to roll it out as well. Uh, and then we have an, a, a big initiative. Um, about half of the people that work at UNOS are involved in uh, IT, actually. Uh, and we're developing these um, application program interfaces. Uh, and these are applications to uh, interface the UNOS data systems directly with hospital um, electronic health records. Um, and so we're hoping to devise a system where EPIC will talk to UNET um, and data can be transmitted directly from uh, EPIC into UNET. Um, and certainly that has, uh, I think, potential patient safety implications um, in terms of data collection, data monitoring, and things like that. Uh, we're actually piloting a system, uh, pilot testing an, app, an API with um, uh, one of the OPOs in California because OPOs use a relatively limited number of data uh, applications, and, and so we've div and they're a bit more simple. Um, Epic is a bit complicated, um, and so that that is sort of something in evolution. Um, and again, our goal overall is to be less punitive and really in terms of safety monitoring um, and quality oversight to, to promote really uh, the notion of a just culture. Uh, we want to balance the need for an open and honest reporting environment uh, with a quality learning environment and culture. Um, and a just culture really requires a change in focus from errors um, and outcomes. Um, to system design and management uh, for behavioral choices of individuals and institutions. Um, they often make, uh, it's often, um, uh, the airline industry is often held up as an example. Um, and, and in the United States, the airline industry, you know, reporting is encouraged uh, of safety issues in an open and confidential uh, and in a non-punitive way. In other countries, that's less so. Um, and currently, I think, you know, in Asia, you know, uh, Asian airlines, the culture is, uh, you know, if, an, if, a, um, if, if a safety event is reported, uh, somebody's going to pay. Uh, and there's a punitive aspect to that. And, and a lot of people view the current OPTN system as a little bit more in line with an Asian airline system. And so we really want to get away from the punitive aspects of safety reporting and make it part of the culture uh, that benefits everybody. Um, and a quote from Henry Ford uh, is that if everyone is moving forward together, then success takes care of itself. And I think, again, I, that's I think, the end of what I have to say. So uh, if there are questions, I'll try to answer them. And I, again, want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and, uh, again, commend you as leaders in safety reporting and quality oversight. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Questions for Dr. Klassen? Maybe I'll pop the first question. Sure. Uh, we run into situations where a center wants to report an event, and the event uh, pertains to the OPO activity. And there is quite a bit of sensitivity if the center reports an activity that they encountered but pertains to the OPO. And the OPO comes back and says, well, we do have an internal process for that. We don't need to report that. How would you deal with that? Well, I, I think, you know, when in doubt, I think potential safety events, you know, maybe, maybe your OPO has, you know, ha has an internal event or has an internal mechanism to do that. Although clearly in this case, it didn't work. Yes. Uh, but that's not, there are 58 OPOs in the country. And so we sort of view safety reporting as, as an opportunity to learn and improve the system as a whole. And so an issue that affects you, know, you and your OPO uh, can also affect other, other systems as well. And so I think you know, if you take the view that you know, everybody is in this together and uh, it, it's a system-wide safety net that we're attempting to, to construct, I think, I think reporting these things you know, benefits everybody. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, you know, the the regulatory consequences of most of this stuff really are not, you know, a, as onerous as, as as people would have them uh, would have you believe. You know? yeah. So, any questions from the group? Uh, I'm fascinated that the fact that the first or top category is communication, and we work here a lot uh, when we have exchange of information, whether when a transplant offer, organ offer happens, or we transplant a patient, or we communicate across groups, 
Can you share some examples, if you know of any, of what kind of domains of communication occur? Is it OPO to center or within a center or within an OPO? It, it really, you know, it's everywhere. I mean, it's within OPOs, it's within, you know, like the example I had of, you know, communicating ongoing need for a lab follow-up within an OPO. It's uh, communications within an operating room, it's between staff, it's between, um, you know, OPOs and transportation couriers, it's between transplant coordinators and, you know, admi their administration. You know, I think there, you know, the opportunity, so to speak, for communication mishaps occurs everywhere. I think, you know, again, in terms of, so much of it is around data reporting and things like that. And I think, you know, to the extent that we can automate a lot of that, I think, you know, some of that can be addressed that way. I think ongoing, you know, there's a lot of staff turnover uh, in transplantation, you know. Um, and, and I think, you know, education for communication issues has to be constant. You know, you always have to be educating and updating and policy changes and people need to be aware of things as they evolve. But I think it's, you know, education is constant. Um, communication always has to be uh, at the top of the list. So. Okay. One more question. Should UNOS separate patient safety portal from regulatory action and through the MPSC? Yes, they are, they are separate. Uh, but, but clearly... Um, I'm referring to actions based on findings that are self-reported. Self-reported? So in other words, if a center self-reports through the patient safety portal, and it so happens it turns out to be a violation of, of policy. Does it correct. go to the Does it go to the MPSC or can it go to the MPSC? Should it still go to the MPSC and should it result in in action, or remain in the safety portal and be acted upon that way? Well, I think um, it's it's a fair question, uh, and you know I I'm not sure what your opinion is, but but as it stands now, yes, I mean policy violations. You know, we are, we are, by the final rule, required to report policy violations to the MPSC. So, yeah. you know, I, I think it has more to do with the MPSC structure and not so much uh, what, what the internal UNO staff does with it, but I think the, M, I think the MPSC is also, as an organization, is something that's going to undergo evolution as we go forward. I think, sure. you know, there's, there's a, a, an, a, a move, a, 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 an effort within UNOS to, to evolve the MPSC into more of a quality oversight structure. And I think, you know, as outcome measures change, um, you know, and there is less focus on hard, definable endpoints, you know, and, and I think the, OP, the uh, MPSC can, can evolve as well. So I think, you know, it, it's, there's, a, there, there's a balance that has to be struck. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, Kelly? Uh, uh, go ahead. If, Speak up. Um, you mentioned some of the you mentioned some of the videos that you offer for education and then some of the initiatives about education related to the planning risk for patients. Do you have patient education videos available or is that something that um, you would plan to incorporate in uh, that initiative? Um you know, our focus has been primarily on centers and OPOs and the transplant community itself. I mean, we do have some patient um, education material that we've made available, but in terms of videos, uh, at this point, uh, it's pr the pr focus has been primarily on um, uh, uh, the transplant community itself rather than patients. You know, you know, we haven't done a lot of patient advocacy directly, and, and UNOS doesn't, as an organization, really interact directly with patients uh, so much. Um, you know, you could argue whether that's the correct thing to do or not. I mean, we, we, get, we, ta we have a patient, uh, you know, uh, the ability to accept uh, reports from patients, and we do that all the time. But in terms of, you know, in terms of sort of a directly educating patients, uh, we actually, I think, see that more as the transplant center's responsibility. You know, practices vary from center to center, and I think to try to define uniform, nationally applicable uh, 
patient education becomes a little bit of a challenge. And so I think we tend to see it more as uh, you know, a transplant center responsibility. Whether that's you know, the way it should be or not, we're, we're certainly open to uh, proposals to do otherwise, uh, for sure. Yes? Mm -hmm. safety, donor safety. Um, my comment is, as you showed your other slide, is you have a lot of reported data which is then kind of discarded as irrelevant or unimportant. And how do you find to, um, with, with your transplant centers, to find that sweet, uh, sweet spot where we're reporting what you want and enough of what you want without creating too much extra work? Um, well, that is some, some of the, what is labeled as extra data or things that are discarded, you know, in terms of the number of reports versus the number of things that are actually investigated. Some of that is actually, you get duplicate reports, you know, like two centers will report the same event uh, or the OPO and the centers will report the same event. Um, so it's not, you know, everything that gets reported. Um, you know, in terms of um, uh, infectious disease reporting, not every positive culture needs to be reported, and so we've put out some education and guidance, at, you know, to do that. I mean, there's stuff that we don't want to see, um, and so it's really kind of an educational effort um, to do that. Um, you know, and we try to um, try to limit that to some extent. I mean, we're, you know, the the data, the reporting requirements. I mean, we're always sort of willing to evolve those. Um, and again, there is sort of a sweet spot. Uh, we do want to analyze the data. We don't want to just collect data and have it sit. Uh, we want to make, again, stuff that, that is actionable. You know, collecting data that nobody can do anything about isn't, doesn't help anybody. So, um, you know, it, it's an ongoing evolutionary thing. So. Other questions? Well, Dr. Claston, thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you.